Father which art in heaven, we come before you today with bow down heads just to say thank you in so many ways, Lord. Lord, we lift our hearts to you. As the dawn breaks, may we carry this unity as we share into every moment knowing that we are one with the risen Christ. Lord, we lift our eyes to you. As the sunrise may this moment stay with us, reminding us to look for the beautiful colors of promises in your word, Lord. We lift our prayers to you as the dew air falls. May we breathe this moment in knowing that like the earth, you sustain us. Keep us and work within us always, Lord. And so we lift our voice to you. We celebrate the greatness day in history when Jesus rose from death, defeated the darkness, and bathed the world in stoning, retrogression of light. May we ever live to praise you, Lord. We just want to say thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus that has died for us, that has given his life for all this world, the sins that, was, that we was facing. We just thank you, Lord, for this special day that we, we can come before you and lift you up and give you all the glory that you deserve. You are a great, wonderful God, our precious, loving Savior. So thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to bow down before you. We ask you to bless each and every one here this morning. We give you praise, Lord. We glorify you. We ask for the mercy. We ask for your grace, continuous grace. So thank you once again for all of our sins that we committed, Lord. We know that you are a forgiven God and no one else can set up our desire. So we just thank you once again for your loving service in our lives. Thank you for my mind. Thank you for being able to see and hear. Thank you for being able to read your word. To comprehend is what you are saying, Lord, because I know your words are all good promises. So I'm looking for this day to come when you return, Lord, to lift us up into heaven for eternity. So thank you once again. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
again, Father God, you have allowed us to come to the house of worship one more time, Father God. We come to say thank you. Father God, we come to say thank you for Union Grove as a whole today, Father God. Father God, we come praying for the sick and the shut in, Father God, the, the bereaved families, Father. Father God, we know it's your will. It will be done, Father God. So we just ask you to just continue to bless them, Father God, continue to keep them. Father God, we thank you for this day, Father God. A day we have seen, Father God, and we'll never see again, Father. So we say thank you for that, Father God. Father God, my brothers have said thank you for health and strength, Father God. Oh, we thank you for health and strength, Father God, because none, none of this would be possible, Father, if it wasn't for you, Father. So we thank you for health and strength, Father God. Father God, we thank you that you teach us to love one another, Father God, to, to pray for one another. Father God, that's what it's all about, Father God, praying and thanking and blessing each other, Father. So we thank you today, Father. Thank you for this time to come and worship, Father. Thank you for just being able to be a witness for you, Father God. For you have been so good to us, Father God. Oh, Father God, you have you have died, Father God, and you have rose, Father God. Oh, Father God, they say you, say you stayed in the grave all all night Friday, Father God, and Father God, you stayed in the grave all day Saturday, Father God, but early Sunday morning, Father God. Said early Sunday morning, Father God, you rose, Father God, and you rose with all power, Father. And we thank you today, Father God. And we thank you for that power, Father, that, that dwells within us, Father God, that tells us right from wrong, Father God, to, to, to go the right way, Father. We just thank you for everything that you do, Father. I bow on my knees before your throne, Father God, and I know my life is not my own, Father God, and I thank you today, Father. I just thank you for just being able to bow down, Father God. Oh, we love you so very much, Father God, because you first loved us, Father God. Thank you today, Father God. Thank you for families, Father God. Continue to bless each and every family, Father God. Oh, Father God, then we, we thank you for our children, Father. Continue to keep them, Father God, to protect them, Father God. Oh, Father God, this world is, is just rampant with, with sin, Father God, so we just... We just want to continue to pray, Father God, to you, Father, that you would do, the, do, do your will, Father God. Be with this world today, Father God. Continue to, to, to be in their lives, Father, to dwell in their lives that they would do the right thing in this world, Father. Oh, Father God, we thank you today. We want to go on up high today, Father God. We want to sing praises, Father God, and we'll continue to be a witness for you, Father. Father God, this... Be with our pastor today, Father God. Hold him up, Father God. Let him speak from all high, Father. Tell us just said the word today, Father God. Somebody may need the word today, Father God. Somebody might want to be saved today, Father God. Oh, Father God, we just thank you today for all you do for us. You're such a good God, Father God. Father God, continue to keep my children, Father God. Continue to dwell in their lives, Father, that they will continue to do the, the right things, Father. Father God, we just love you. I thank you today. In Jesus' name I do and pray and ask it all. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Someone give God a hand and clap for praise. I was on the, I got to tell y'all this little story. This is a true story. Yesterday had a little boy. His mama wanted me to put him in the shot put. And I don't know a lot of those of you who know about track and field events, I don't know a lot about field events. I know about the running events. So it was, a, it was an older guy. He was standing there, and he he was, I was telling him, I said, Phoenix, I don't know too much about the shot put. I know you just bring it from here, and you 
throw it like that. His mama wanted him to do it. We just throw them in there. And this guy came over, he said, uh, Coach, can I, can I share something with him? I said, sure. He said, young man, he said, you believe in God? The guy said, yes. He said, let me tell you how to throw this shot put. Just hold it like, like this, like your coach said, and then when you throw it, act like you're high-fiving God. I was standing there. He's asked the little boy, he said, look, man, do you understand what I'm saying? He said, yes, sir. He said, what I, what I say do? He said, when you throw it, just act like you high-fiving God. Yeah. He asked the little boy, he said, little boy, do you understand what I was saying? He said, yes, sir. He said, what did I say do? He said, bring the shot put right here, and then when I throw it, just act like I'm high-fiving God. I'm going to say it again. He said, little boy, do you understand what I'm saying? He said, yes, sir. He said, do you really understand what I'm saying? He said, yes, sir. He said, how did I want you to do it? He said, you told me to put the shot put right here. And when I throw it, act like I'm high-fiving God. Amen. 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 I'm going to say it again. <laughs> he said, little boy, do you understand what I'm saying? He said, yes, sir. He said, what did I ask you to do? You said, when you throw the shot put and when I throw it, act like I'm high-fiving God. Amen. 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 I, I, I got two witnesses. I'm going to say it again. He said, little boy, what did I ask you to do? He said, when I throw the shot put, act like I'm high-fiving God. Amen. 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 Act like I'm high-fiving God. Yeah. Act like I'm high-fiving God. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
morning, good morning. The Lord has brought us here again. This is Resurrection Sunday, and we are so happy to be here. On behalf of our pastor, Glenn P. Taylor, we welcome you all. And this morning, we are so happy to have with us Kaya and Moses ducking in from college. We have Benson, I see, back home. And then we have a visiting with us for the first time, Chastity and DeMichael. As you all know, we've been praying for Chastity and DeMichael, and they are here worshiping with us today. So I just want to welcome you all, all our children that have come home, everyone, welcome. And just let's go further, praising the Lord. Amen. Amen. time to lift our offering. Will the verses come forward, please? And while they are coming, let us stand and Malachi 3, 10. Let us begin. Bring you all to the storehouse. Fill the other house. Then you feel the Lord. Back to go. 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 Let us pray. Dear gracious God, we thank you that you gave to us, given us the opportunity to give back to you. Thank you, dear gracious God, that this offering that we are taking may be used for the furthering of your kingdom. It will scatter, continue to bless us as we stand in need of, and we will continue to give. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Forever in heaven, forever in heaven, for all. 
time for our scripture reading, please, please. Will everyone please stand? The it'll be Leviticus chapter 27. Leviticus chapter 27. Let us all uh, read together, stay together. I have strength against us. Speak unto the children of Israel. Say unto them. Say thou. So says it with God. Oh, I shall be the Lord. There. You see. Lives. Big as well. And the fear. As. And you see, for month. Miles into. And the priest is required him according to his ability. I shall survive the priest. He needs to be a prayer of men. All that any man given of search for us should be holy. He shall not alter it or change it. A good for a bad. A bad for a good. It should all things but if he had any clean breath, we could go sacrifice. No, it's a priest said, whether it be good or bad, as thou bad who art the priest, so shall it be. But of this shall be of the and when a man shall sent in his house, be holy unto the Lord, being the priest. Estimation shall he accordance to the seed thereof, and home of barley seeds should be a badge of it. If it is sanctified as field from the year of the Jubilee, according to thy estimation, it shall stand. But if even unto the years of Jubilee, and it shall be abated from my estimation. And if he that sanctifies the Lord, he will love him. Then he shall add his family to do it. And it shall be assured to him. And if he will not redeem him, or if he will not anymore, but the field will be the Jubilee. Shall be holy unto the Lord, as a field devoted. Position thereof shall be the priest. And if a man sanctify unto the Lord, feel as Paul brought him up. If he is not in the field, works on that estimation. If he is in the field, actually, he will be unto the Lord. Oh. 
and all their information is going to your country in generations. We die out here. God should No man. And it shall be sold according to thy estimation. Now we're standing, no devoted thing, and a man shall devote unto the Lord. For man, both of man and beast, in the field of his possession, shall be sold or the redeemed. Even devoted, they are no sin. Sudden devoted, so we can put to them. All the depth of the land, all of the seed of the land, of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord is over on the Lord. If a man will be all deemed altered by, he shall add there to the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithes of the Lord, can't be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether he be good or bad. Yeah, he's good. Mm. 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 He shall the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses of Israel in Mount Sinai. May God bless the reading, the hearing of His holy word.
set me free. I could never repay. I could never repay you for your love. I could never repay, Lord. I could never repay you for your love. If I had ten thousand tongues, I still could never. I could never repay you for. Never read. 
Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by thy power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. But draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer to thy precious bleeding side. Now, Lord, here again I stand, stand in me and speak through me, so that the words which I speak will be thine and not mine. Hide me behind the sacred altar of your word, so that you and your voice only will be heard. Have thine own way. You be the preacher and I your instrument, using me in your service, so that the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are my strength, you're my redeemer. I give you thanks, I give you glory, I give you praise. In the perfect, precious, powerful name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord, our Savior, your Son. Once again, with all reverence unto our Heavenly Father, who is Creator of the ends of the earth, He who faints not and neither is weary, for whom there is no searching of His understanding. 
He gives power to the faint and to those who have no might, no willpower. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. And those who serve him, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, whom we celebrate, not just today, but every day, because every day is a blessing that comes as a result of his sacrifice to the Holy Spirit, who is our comforter and our paraclete, who makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. To all of you who are hearing me and listening to my voice, we bid you greetings in the name of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there are two verses uh, which we would like to focus in on. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, using or looking at verse 13 and verse 14. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain. And your faith is also vain. Again, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. I want to utilize uh, some words that are found that are couched in this 14th verse as our frame of reference. It is a postulation, if you will. Uh, it is a supposition, so to speak, uh, of uh, just to bring us to a point of spiritual sobriety. And so I want to look at the words, if Christ be not risen, if Christ be not risen. Today we celebrate the fact that Christ is risen. Is that not what this celebration is about? We celebrate that Christ is risen. But if Christ be not risen, if there be no resurrection of the dead, it starts there, then Christ was not resurrected. Or, uh, and, and then if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain and our faith is vain. One of, the, one of the things about the Sadducees that made them sad is that they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Did you know that? The Sadducees had a fatalistic approach at life. But we know based upon our scripture and based upon our eyes of faith that the resurrection is true. 
I want to, as we, Paul raises this question, as he postulates in regarding the resurrection for those who were having doubts and for those whose faith was wavering, for those who found themselves weak in faith, as the apostle Paul looked at and listened and heard the different rumblings about the resurrection. Some believing that Christ did uh, get up from the grave. Others believe that he did not. Paul then postulates and he says, if there be no resurrection, as he addresses the uh, theology or the philosophy of the Sadducees. He says, if there be no resurrection, I don't want you to be misled by bad teaching. If there be no resurrection of the dead, if you live with a fatalistic approach that death ends everything, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain. And your faith is also vain. I want to begin as by dealing with the declaration of the resurrection, but not just the declaration of the resurrection, but the de declaration of the resurrection of Christ Jesus. For we declare, it has been declared, and it is still being declared, uh, even as it was declared in song on this morning that Jesus lives, that he has been, that he is resurrected. Uh, he is resurrected unto eternal life. First of all, when we consider the declaration of the resurrection of Christ Jesus, it is a declaration of promise. A declaration of promise. Jesus himself made the promise and gave us the promise, gave the promise to his disciples. And, and he said the seed has to fall to the ground and be planted before it comes up again. Uh, before it can sprout, it has to go down and be planted in the earth. And then he also gave us the promise, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. That was his promise. That was just one of the various promises, but one that was uniquely and particularly uh, associated with his own resurrection. And then there, remember he said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And so we have the promise of resurrection but more so the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. So it is a declaration of promise, but it is not only a declaration of promise, it is also a declaration of power. It is a declaration of power. 
once again, when we hear the words from the lips of our Savior saying, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. He is declaring, I have power to lay my life down. For he says, no man taketh my life from me, but I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. It is a power that no man can duplicate. It is a power that nobody else has. And he declared the power of his own ability to resurrect himself. He declared the power. It is a declaration of power. And so when we preach, when we teach, when we proclaim, when we share the good news and the gospel story, we share the gospel story of the power of Jesus Christ in resurrection. Maybe that's why the Apostle Paul would write in the book of Philippians, uh, chapter 4, I believe, or uh, he says, uh, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And so there is power. He, he has power. So the declaration, when we talk about the declaration of the resurrection of Christ Jesus, we look at it and we proclaim it, we declare it as a declaration of promise and a declaration of power, but then it is also a declaration of provision. It is a declaration of provision. So what is the provision associated with this declaration? Jesus says to his disciples, uh, if I don't go away, uh, the comforter will not come. And so the provision is I'm going to die, be resurrected, and then I'm going to leave you so that the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, will come. And unlike what I'm doing, he shall abide with you. And so you don't have to pray and say, Lord, send your spirit down because once he came down, he stayed and he will never leave us. <clears throat> Declaration of a provision and it is the Holy Spirit who guides us in all truth. It is the Holy Spirit who comforts us. It is the Holy Spirit who teaches us. It is the Holy Spirit who gives us direction in our lives. Not a little birdie, but the Holy Spirit. When you said, I, I should have followed my mind, you should have followed what the Holy Spirit spoke into your mind. Huh. And so we have the declaration of the resurrection of Christ Jesus. But there's a second thing, and that is we have when we listen to Paul as he postulates in this passage and says, if Christ be not risen, then, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. Uh, there's another passage in, in which he would tell us that we of all men are most miserable. And so, what we have to look at now is the dependency on the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Not only is there a declaration, but there is also a dependency. We are dependent on the resurrection of Christ Jesus. We are dependent, we are dependent. Uh, the first 
way in which we are dependent has to do with the fact that our expectant hopes are dependent on the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Our expectant hopes, our hope of eternal life, our hope of life after death, our hope that when this earthly body of this tabernacle is dissolved, that we have another building. Our hope is dependent on the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, ye may be also. If he is not risen, then there is no place prepared for us. So our hope for eternal life is rooted in the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Our expectant hopes, our expectant hopes, our, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground, sinking sand. I, I expect and hopes are, are dependent on the resurrection of Christ Jesus. But there is something else. Our eternal heritage is dependent on the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Our heritage of being an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. The heritage that we have, that we expect, our inheritance is dependent on his resurrection. For, for when he, he is the first fruits of them who sleep, of, of those who have been asleep, who are asleep in the grave. And, and the reality is those of us who, who pass away and we go again to the words of Jesus. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life and he that liveth and believeth in me uh, shall never die. And so if we don't die, what happened? We fall asleep and we sleep in Christ. Now we understand, or we, we, we don't have all of the, uh, we don't know all of the nuances. We don't know all of the uh, attributes uh, that belong to death. We know that death keeps us from earthly activities. It keeps us from doing things that we have done, and it takes us away from the presence of those whom we have loved. We know that death robs the living of the presence of loved ones. Am I right about that? But, but, but the truth of the matter is we who know God and know the Lord, we fall asleep in the Lord. Thank you, Brother Sam Williams. And I say thank you to him because he came to me with a question uh, a week ago dealing with uh, those who, uh, who die or where are they. And some of us have some wrongful ideas about people when they die. I hear people talking about, yeah, I know they're up there baking cakes and pies. I know they're up there somewhere uh, playing ball or dancing a jig and doing, we, we have them doing all kinds of things, but, but, but death puts you to sleep. We got to stop lying on folk, talking about what they're doing in heaven. If anything, they are asleep. 
Lazarus died and was carried away in the bosom of Abraham. Uh, Samuel died, was asleep, and 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 and. and and Saul conjured, got with some witnesses to try to conjure up his spirit. And, and Saul, uh, Samuel said, Saul, why have you disturbed my rest? Gotta get, get, gotta get away from this falling into the pattern of saying and doing what we hear other folks say and do. Thinking that it sound good, and now I tell you this: uh, for those who are not asleep in the Lord, there is good evidence that they are in hell. You don't believe me? Come here, come here. Uh, both uh, rich man and Lazarus, rich man, poor man died, and Lazarus was carried away in in the bosom of Abraham. But but the rich man that we call Dives uh, in hell, he lifted up his eyes and being in torment said father abraham he looked up and saw lazarus a great way off because there's a gulf yeah. fixed between uh, heaven and hell yeah. Yeah. our our eternal heritage but 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 there's another thing and that is that is our everlasting habitation uh, the fact that I want to live, I want to live with the Lord. Do I have some company? Anybody in here want to live with the Lord? To live eternally? To have habitation in a place of no more sorrow? No more pain? No more heartaches? No more hunger? No more suffering? It's called the land of no more in terms of all of the bad things that we experience here. I want to go to a land where we'll never grow old. No more weeping. No more wailing. The land of no more. Got a lot of problems down here. But when I get there, I'll be in the land of no more. An everlasting habitation where, where there will be joy, peace, love, contentment, worship as we worship the king. <sighs> Every day, a sunny day for the Lamb of God will give light to the kingdom. But there is a third and last thing that we want to lift up because as Paul postulates and says, if there be uh, no resurrection of the dead, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain. But, but that's the only arena where Paul speaks with the possibility that Christ is not risen. Because everywhere else, he declares the dependability on the resurrection of Christ Jesus. And that's really where we want to end. We want to just deal with the depend dependability. You can depend on the fact that Christ Jesus got up and rose from the grave. That he is resurrected unto eternal life. 
So when we deal with the dependability of the resurrection of Christ Jesus, the first thing that I would say unto you today is that the resurrection of Christ Jesus is reality. It's real. It's, it's not fantasy. It is not fiction. It is not make-believe. It is not a fable. But it is real. I, I, I like to tell this story every now and then. I've told it before, but I'll share it again. It was about a boy, a little boy named Philip. And, and little Philip had Down syndrome. And, and he attended a third grade Sunday school class with uh, seven, several eight-year-old boys and girls. And, and typically of that age, children don't really uh, have sympathy or empathy for other children, uh, for children with Down syndrome or other problems. But, but here is a case where little Philip had Down syndrome and kids would often tease him and laugh at him. But, but the teacher gave an assignment to the Sunday school class and told them to find something that represented new life. And, and certainly children went out to try to find things that represented new life. And one child brought back a flower. Another child brought back uh, uh, s uh, some grass or clover. And they brought back different things that they felt represented new life. And uh, they had been told to put it in one of those eggs uh, from, I believe there was a, uh, the company was called Leg. You know, legs that make stockings and uh, uh, they would have their stockings in eggs and yeah, some of these women, are, you, you, you ought to know about the legs and, and, and uh, even if you don't buy them, you might know the brand. But, but they would have their stockings in these little eggs. And, and so she gave all the children an egg. And so different children brought back their eggs. And each of them had something in it. But little Philip, went, as the teacher went uh, opening one after another, and the children acknowledging who, uh, who, whose egg it was, finally they came to little Philip's egg. And, and, and when they opened it, up, it was empty, and and <clears throat> the teacher and all the kids start saying, "Whose egg is that?" And little Philip say, "It's it's my egg," and and they say, "Philip, you didn't understand the assignment. You didn't do it right. You're not fair." And little Philip say, "Yes, I did. I I did do it right." They say, "Well, what? Where is your new life?" He said, "I I, I did this like this because the." tomb was empty the tomb was empty I'm representing the fact that there was new life because the tomb was empty the resurrection of Christ Jesus is reality but then the resurrection of Christ Jesus and, and, and the reality of his resurrection was seen in the fact that he was viewed by so many, not just by uh, the disciples and not just by Mary Magdalene, not, not just by uh, by, by Cleophas and, and another disciple on the Emmaus road. There were 40 who saw him at one time. He, he appeared. He didn't make his resurrection a secret. But, but, but even before then, the soldiers that guarded the tomb went back and were paid to lie to say that there was no resurrection but it was a reality. The stone was rolled away, reality. The tomb was empty, reality. The grave clothes laid aside, reality. And so we have the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But Christ Jesus, when we look 
and listen at the, this text. There's something that Paul is doing in this postulation. While it seems like he is uh, given uh, uh, access or given uh, uh, pause for us to have some doubt, he is in fact giving us a reassurance. It is really about reassuring. And so when we look at this text, we have the re resurrection of Christ being reassuring. Yeah. It's not just a reality, but it is reassuring. I'm glad that I don't have any doubts about the resurrection. It's been assured through history, even by those who were non-Christian and yet called historians, people like uh, uh, Eusebius uh, uh, and then uh, Josephus, who, who was a Jewish historian, they had to admit that the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea was suddenly empty empty, reassured that, that he lives. And, 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 and finally, uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is resounding. It is resounding. And, and, and we're re it's resounding in the same way that his birth was resounding. You remember at his birth that the angels came and uh, they, they formed a chorus uh, and, and they declare glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Just as the announcement was made, just as the prophets had predicted uh, that Jesus Christ would be born in Bethlehem, Judah. Art thou Bethlehem the least among? Yes, it was predicted in the Old Testament just like the birth was predicted for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given the government of the world shall be upon his shoulder his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father Prince of Peace. That was the prediction about his birth, but that was also a prediction about his death. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I'm so glad that we have uh, the scripture to back it up. And so now it is being resounded and, and, and Peter stood up and preached and said, this same Jesus whom you crucified was resurrected from the dead and has now ascended to the be with his father, this same Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. And so you ought to believe in the resurrection. Let, let me back up and go back to the reassurance of the resurrection. Uh, it is said that uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, was greatly influenced by the writings of the Apostle Paul. And so Benjamin Franklin uh, penned his own epitaph. And, and I'd like to kind of re, I'd like to read it for you so that uh, maybe you'll be able to get the gist of what he was saying. In the epitaph that Ben Franklin wrote about himself, he, he wrote about himself in the form of a book, of being a book, his life, he and his life being a book. And so he said, the body of B. Franklin printer like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding lies here. Food for worms, but the work shall not be wholly lost, for it will, as he believe, appear once more in a new and more perfect edition 
corrected and amended by the author. Now, if you don't understand what he's saying, he's saying that though his life has been tattered and torn, that he will have a new life and the author of life, who is God Almighty, will put him in a new body because when we are resurrected, we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye because this mortal must take a put off mortality and put on immortality. This corruptible must put off corruption and put on incorruption. But Ben wasn't the first person to have a view of resurrection. That was a fella by the name of Job. In the midst of his suffering, when his body was laced with sores from head to foot, Job said in chapter 19 he, of his writing, he said, I know that my Redeemer is yet alive. And though the skin worms come and eat up my flesh, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Now wait a minute, if the skin worms eat it up, how is it that I'm gonna see him after they've eaten up my flesh? I like the way I heard it some years ago. I heard years ago about how the skin worms eat the flesh and the sparrow eats the skin worm, and a hawk comes and eats the sparrow, and then an eagle comes and eats the hawk and flies to yonder mountain, and the mountain folds up on the eagle, but then the Gabriel blows his horn, and the mountain gives up the eagle, the eagle gives up the hawk, the hawk gives up the sparrow. The sparrow gives up the skin worm. The skin worm gives up the flesh. And the flesh is changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Yeah. Job says, I'm going to see him for myself. Mine eyes shall see and not another. I'm not dependent on anybody else. I know my Redeemer is alive. Well, that's about the end of it. I have this pension. I have this, this, this urge and desire to often research uh, the history of songs. There's a song very appropriate for today. And I did some, I just kind of did some background work on the song. The song was written by Bill and Gloria Gaither, more so by Gloria than Bill. And I want to share with you her account of writing the song. She says, I'm a wife and a mother. And it was in the middle of the upheaval in the 60s that we were expecting our third baby. The drug culture was in full swing. Existential thought had obviously saturated every area of American thought. The cities were seething with racial tension. And the God is dead pronouncement that giggled his way all throughout our educational system. She explained that Bill had been down physically and emotionally with mononucleosis. They had been verbally attacked by a close friend for their Christian ministry. The stress on them was very intense. So Gloria continues by saying, it was on New Year's Eve that I sat alone in darkness and quiet of our living room, 
thinking about the world and our country and Bill's discouragement and the family problems and about our baby yet unborn. Who in their right mind would bring a child into a world like this? That was my thinking. The world is so evil, influences beyond our control are so strong, what will happen to the child? I can't quite explain what happened at that moment, so she says, but suddenly I felt a release from it all. The panic that had begun to build inside was greatly dispelled by a reassuring presence that engulfed my life and drew my attention. Gradually, the fear left and the joy began to return. I knew I could have that baby and face the future with optimism and trust. It was the resurrection affirming itself in our lives once again. It was life conquering death in the regularity of my day. The second verse of the song was the first part of the song that was written relating the birth of their newborn baby to the hope that we find in Jesus' resurrection. The rest of the song was written around the second verse. And Bill Gaither named the tune for the song, Resurrection. Here, is, here are the words of that song. God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Now, the part that was written first is this. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he brings. But greater still, the calm assurance the child can face uncertain days because he lives. You know the chorus of that, don't you? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fears are gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth living just because he lives. But I think I want to put that last verse in there. And then one day I'll cross the river. I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives. I feel pretty good right now, but can I say it the way I feel it? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, my fears are gone. Because, because, because I know he holds the future. And life is worth living just because he lives. Just because. And so I will resound it. I will proclaim it. And I will tell you my preaching of the cross of Christ and the resurrection is not in vain. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you is our prayer. If you are here today and you have not accepted or you've not come to know the reality of the resurrection today is a mighty good day 
to put your faith in that which is real and the resurrection of Christ Jesus is real. Jesus says come, the church says come, the spirit says come, whosoever will, let him come. Sister Lawrence, would you come and do because he lives? Again, if you're here and you have not accepted the Lord Jesus, the Christ, this is a good day to do so. God sent his son. That's, that's. They called him Jesus. He came to love. He'll land for giving. That's, that's, that's. and we would like for you to join us downstairs uh, in the fellowship area for uh, breakfast. Following that, we will have our uh, Sunday school. Our Father in heaven, how thankful we are for the resurrection 
the reality and the reassurance and the resounding that the resurrection is real. For in it, in the resurrection, we have our hope, our heritage, and our habitation. We thank you, Lord, for the promise, the power, and the provision of the resurrection. Now, Lord, again, as we look again in celebration style at this day, keep us mindful of the great sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, for what took place before the resurrection was the covering of our sins and the nailing of our sins to Calvary's cross. And so we say thank you. Now, the grace of our Lord Jesus the Christ and the love of God, the sweet communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit, guide us in our going and keep us in your tender loving care now and forever. And as we prepare to partake of the food that has been prepared, that our bodies might receive nourishment, we pray that the food the natural food will be to our bodies as the spiritual word is for our souls. And that we would be mindful that there are people with appetites and no food, and that there are people with food and no appetite, so that we won't be ungrateful nor wasteful. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.